The reading today is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he said this as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. May we, may we be granted wisdom and courage for interpretation. So today, in many churches, is a, well, in all churches, is a day that's called Ascension Sunday. It's also the last Sunday in the season of Easter. Now, in my church growing up, and I know in many of yours, we didn't follow the revised common lectionary. I don't, I didn't even know what that was. Okay, that's not me. Um, and, and, um, we didn't really even follow a church calendar. So when I first started in this business, I thought that all of these things, like the Revised Common Lectionary and the church calendar, were, were cumbersome. Um, but as time has passed and I followed the rhythms of the church year, I see a wisdom in these special days. They call our attention not just to the church year, but to changes in, the li in our lives, the lives of the church, in lives eternal. They are rooted in the basic human experience, things we all can relate to regardless of where we are on life's journey or our condition or effect. So ascension. After his suffering on the cross, and much to the disciples' surprise, Jesus returned unexpectedly and appeared off and on for 40 days, giving instruction and encouragement to all he encountered. Now remember, there's code language all over in the Bible. And when you hear the word, the number 40, this is biblical code language. And those hearing this tale would have known that when they heard the number 40, that the story they were about to hear was about new life, new growth, transformation, and or change from one great task to another great task. So throughout these 40 days, the disciples stayed hidden in a room away from prying eyes of those in the civil authority who had assured Jesus' death. Yet even while mystified and afraid, the disciples and all hiding with them grew in confidence and friendship to one another through this shared loss and deep devotion. Now remember, these folks had left their families and careers for a nomadic life of commitment to an engaging and transformative leader, teacher. 
And just when they'd grown accustomed to his ways, just as they had begun to see that this charismatic person really could be, in their mind, the political leader they had imagined who would bring about a revival of a government as mighty as the ancient kingdom of David, just as they felt they'd hit their stride, Jesus was arrested for sedition, for rabble-rousing, and executed. And after his death, Jesus appeared in their room with them, on the road with others. To them, they thought perhaps the messianic age of old, this glorious kingdom of David, really was going to happen. And then today, Jesus leaves them once again. So today's scene takes place on Mount Olivet. Once again, code language. Anytime there's a hill or a mountain, it means pay attention. So Jesus' disciples gather with him and want to know if now, now finally, is now the time that the political power and prestige will be returned to the kingdom of Israel. The disciples recognized that Jesus, as the Messiah, prophesied of old, but they envisioned a Messiah who would usher back the, in the Jewish golden age of power, a time reminiscent of King David's reign, a time of the first and glorious temple. Now, Jesus gives them an answer that doesn't tell them what they want to hear. He doesn't mention empire building, riches, influence, and he doesn't mention security. He does tell them that they'll have power, and then he swallowed up in a cloud. And as they stood gawking into the skies, two men appeared and said, why are you looking up for him? Now, when I read this passage, I imagine that there was quite some time passing as they were craning their necks and checking the clouds, hoping to catch a clue of their next steps. I also imagine this like a Terry Gilliam drawing in Monty Python. Um, but it, it, when it's finally clear that they're not going to figure this out for themselves and they haven't a clue what they're doing, Two men in white show up and say, hey, you're looking in the wrong place for Jesus. Don't look up, look around. Now, since that advice seemed as confusing and out of place as did Jesus' sudden assumption into clouds, they look around at each other and return home. They head back to Jerusalem to the place where they'd been gathered since the terrifying and strange events of the crucifixion and resurrection, not to mention the horrific death of their friend Judas and the fact that they needed to come to grips with the parts that they played in Jesus' arrest and their betrayal of him, coming to grips with whom they could trust, even themselves. Not certain what else to do, they returned to the place where they had lived through trauma-inducing times. Now, these people were intimate with friends. They'd traveled together, they'd given up their previous ways of life, and they'd been with Jesus while he taught, healed, and worshipped. Yet throughout their years with Jesus, they kept hoping to an idealized past, a past that none of them had ever experienced after all the reign of David had taken place about a thousand years before Jesus had been born. But the legend was it was a time when all was right, an era seen through beautiful rose-colored glasses. Yet, if we pay attention to the story, Jesus consistently told them of his true mission, of his true character, and what he saw was right in front of them to do. So Ascension Sunday, this day when Jesus disappears for good, and most importantly, those strange men show up in white and say, don't look up. Now this is important 
Because this is the day that reminds us not to look to the clouds in an elusive, misty maybe for our purpose and mission. Jesus was very clear about what it meant to be a follower. We're to love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbors as ourselves. Never once were we pro promised political dominance. In fact, Jesus had a certain attitude of indifference to political bodies, and never once were we promised that things would be easy. But really, this must have been so disappointing to the disciples. They believed Jesus to be the Messiah promised in Isaiah. Jesus had even said that he'd been sent by God so that the oppressed might be set free. Yet even after the terrible and strange events they had lived through, Israel remained nothing but a puny outpost of the Roman Empire. And the Davidic strength of old was nowhere in sight. Once again, they'd experienced something profound. And once again, they didn't know what it meant. They missed it. We see this pattern over and over and over with the disciples. And if it weren't so much like my life, and I guess yours, I'd call them a bunch of knuckleheads. But so they returned to their companions with whom they were in constant study, prayer, worship, and reflection. They returned to no place special. They were at meeting in an upper room. Now, at this time, almost all homes had an upper room. And it was where everyone hung out in a hot climate. It was cool. Because although it was a room, it was open air. It was away from the street, away from windows. So it afforded some privacy to all who gathered there. In their upper room, hidden from prying eyes, they remained looking up in the mystic maybe, hoping for a repeat of Davidic statehood, a theocratic nation state. Instead, when they looked around, they just found themselves in somebody's den. Yet while they were there, turning over the events of the past couple months, pondering the words of the strangers in dazzling white and the unexpected ascension of Jesus, it was there in their room above the street that they found the power that Jesus promised. It was there they realized that they were never called to look up, rather they were to look around, around to the people forgotten, around to those with no homes, to the widows, to the orphans, to the lame, to the sick, to the forgotten, to the downtrodden, and to the children. It was there they realized the power of Jesus was found in their gathered commitment to a community of wholeness, a community of hope, a community where there is enough for all if we share, where people overcome their weaknesses and where all, even children, even women, even the sick are welcomed and affirmed. The disciples had hoped for comfort the disciples had hoped for prestige, but what they got was the strength of community. These past few years have been marked with a global pandemic and arguments over the simplest way to protect others who breathe what we exhale. We've roiled over one mass shooting after another. We've watched our nation's capital be run over by those hoping to topple the government. And then we've heard people with straight faces deny this, saying they were just tourists. We've watched school board meetings devolve into chaos while arguing over John Green novels. And we've been assailed by the 24-hour infotainment news cycle found on network TV, cable TV, and this, all the social media outlets found in the little rectangular computer that we carry with us all the time. Things seemed bleak. Things seemed broken. 
An answer to questions larger than ourselves often seem elusive. But open any history book and one finds loss, war, illness, and human stubbornness and hubris in every generation, even those that the disciples looked back on as the glory years, even those that we may be tempted to look back on as glory years. And I wonder, what have we been doing all this time? Where have we been looking? Have we been standing around looking up? Have we been waiting for some mystic maybe, some grand plan that will make all things right? Have we been thinking just of ourselves, just what we want, just what we need? Have we comfortably participated in the wealth generated by an ever-increasing sales of weaponry? Have we been looking up? Have we been not unlike disciples, so close to the truth, but looking in wrong directions? I think now is a time for us to focus our gaze firmly on one another, to look around, to see with whom we are gathered, to work together for peace, for community, for care of one another, for those gathered in the room, and for those who don't even know that the room exists. To do that, we must know around what and around whom we've gathered and what defines us as Christians. Now, some focus on John 3.16 as the most important scripture for Christians. You know, you see it at every football game. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And this is a lovely scripture. But the author of John is telling us about the character of God, not the character of Christians. It's not impossible for one to believe that God loves us so much that God's own son was sacrificed for us all while doing nothing but sit with that knowledge and that belief. All the while looking up to the holy creator waiting for God to do some great deed once again. One may sit with that belief, that concept of God, while the whole world rages on, while people are shot, while people try to eliminate health care options, while people degrade people of different gender identities, while people deny that our actions, our ways of producing goods and farming land contribute to rapid climate change, and that rapid climate change is causing the greatest migrations of people since the recorded history. It's possible to know this is the character of God and respond with nothing more than thoughts and prayers. If we want to know how we are to respond, if we want to know what the character of a Christian is, even Christians who gather in quiet rooms away from prying eyes while we sort out all of our confusion, we must search for an answer to what is the character of a Christian. When asked what was the greatest commandment, Jesus answered, love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We cannot spend our days craning our necks looking for answers in the sky if we focus our attention on our neighbors. Now, I'm not here to talk about partisan politics, politicians, or pundits. As your pastor, they're not my concern. I'm not here to talk about your rights because rights are government creations. I'm here to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. And as a Christian, you have the gift of life and you have the opportunity to love. Rights language doesn't enter our rhetoric. We're here to talk about where we see brokenness. Because if we see brokenness, we have the opportunity to love toward healing. 
If in love of your neighbor you are concerned about lax gun laws, then as a Christian you should be doing everything that you think is important to make sure that your neighbor is protected. If you are concerned about people's mental health, then as a Christian you must be doing all you can to make certain that our societies and our community does everything that we can to provide access to mental health care. Heck, throw in all health care. If as a Christian you hope to succeed in life, then you to be able to pay for food and shelter, then you must be concerned about access to all forms of health care, about food and shelter for all. If you want to talk about the growing class and racial divide in our society, in our country, then that's okay. But as a Christian, you must be doing all you can to address the systemically racist underpinnings of our societies and deal with what centuries of slavery followed by centuries of racist denial have done in all of our communities, especially those underserved by various opportunities and access to the ways that we as a nation have created generational wealth. If in love of your neighbor you are concerned about disenfranchised young people and about their loneliness and isolation, then as a Christian you must be doing all you can to find ways to engage them, to support our teachers who are under constant threat of cuts and more and more obligations. We must be willing to help children find ways to make friends and to have centers where they can play ball, climb walls, and learn how to grow and to build things. You know, once I, I lived in a neighborhood in Indiana where we said in our neighborhood community that we were very concerned about the children and wanted to be certain that they had places to play. So we boofed up a kind of derelict um, playground we replaced the basketball hoops on the basketball court, and it was lovely. My son and his friends played ball almost every day until one day the hoops mysteriously disappeared. So in a neighborhood meeting, we learned that unfortunately the basketball hoops had attracted unsavory sorts to the neighborhood. Well, those unsavory sorts turned out to be my son's friends. You see, my son was white. He still is. And he <laughs> but his friends were not. If we love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, we will be outraged every time people with legislative abilities create laws that limit access to health care. If we love our neighbors as much as we do ourselves, we, we will cry foul when our fellow Christians define their rights and leave the poor alone for God to sort out. It's time for us to take up the advice of the men in dazzling robes and to stop looking up. It's time for us to hear the words of Jesus and become his witness in the world. It is time to be full of righteous indignation, an anger that is not a fit of rage. Righteous anger is expressed for the sake of others, for our neighbors. It overflows into action on behalf of others. And lest you feel like I'm lecturing you, I will tell you that I see good news abounding. I see it right here in this rather small but determined and kind congregation. I see that it is full of people looking around. Evelyn is doing her mightiest to turn us into a no-waste congregation. Jenny carries the weight of the violent world on her shoulders, and she reminds us to pray and to join in peacekeeping organizations. Um, with one announcement, Jan created a pollinator posse, and it meets to pull weeds and to plant native plants and is building a plan for a campus filled with wildflowers to feed our insect neighbors and plants that will rejuvenate our soil. Karen reminds us of words concerning God, the image of God that hurt, and words concerning the image of God that heal. A whole group of people, Sam, 
Shay, Cody, Claire, Cody, Babe, Ashley, Andy, Jessica, and John all stepped up and formed a youth steering committee. Jane found herself in a season of life where getting out and about's not so easy, yet she sends letters, prays regularly for us, and writes beautiful essays on social media. There are people right here, right around, who are providing music, teaching our children, editing all of our bulletins and newsletters, and caring for those who cannot care for themselves. People on staff and people who are not on staff. Just this past week, we had a social justice committee that people turned out in force. Catherine's going to lead us in a period party. And there are those who provide music and refreshments, those who set up and take down our tables and chairs. And there are those who must turn their attentions to families, to their own health, those who rely on us to hold their space in this community as they rest and heal in their upper room, away from prying eyes. This is good news. This is not a congregation that stands around looking up. This is a congregation, at least in my experience, that lives into the great commandment. There isn't quibbling about the nature of God. There isn't quibbling about who you think is in and who is out. There isn't quibbling about what version of the Bible you think is best. There isn't quibbling. There is love. There is service. There is persistent scanning the horizon to find one's calling. And this is not easy work, but no one said it was going to be easy. So let us continue to stand firm with one another as we love our God and our neighbor, for there we find our hope. And faith, hope, and love, these three are action words. So let us be moved, let us, lest we perish. You know, the disciples anticipated that after Jesus, their new normal was going to be a wealthy and powerful nation state. And, then they, and what they got was someone's rumpus room. Yet look what emerged from that simple, unexpected place when they looked around and saw what needed to be done, even in their own broken, fragile, wondering about their own character and abilities sake. I pray that as we return to this unexpected place that we may be gloriously surprised by the holy work that emerges as we look around, as we love one another, and do what is right before us to do. Amen. <laughs>